Genesis just a story or some kind of religious analogy? Today on Creation Magazine Live, we're going to give you 15 reasons for taking Genesis as real history. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live, the program that gives Christians the kind of faith-building information you'll find in our world-famous Creation Magazine. Today we're going to explore 15 reasons for you to take Genesis as real history. Right. Not as myth, not as allegory, not as, as some fictitious tale, but real history. Right. So we're not going to be talking so much about the scientific evidences, but what the Bible actually says about it and why you should be able to trust it. Yes, that's, a, that's what we want to focus on, the clear teachings of Scripture right. and not so much the science. Right, because I'm sure there's many people out that have heard, um, well, pastors, friends, TV shows, read a Christian book or, or something like that, and it's um, ways that you can explain away Genesis, basically. There's many different ways of looking at it. We hear this all the time when we're out right. speaking, of We can course. modify the text, we can understand it differently, and so on. Right, there's no conflict between science and the Bible, as long as you modify the biblical text. Those types of approaches, right? You don't modify science and stuff like that. So uh, I think a good verse for us to, to start with uh, would, be, would be this one here. I'll, let me put it up for you. It's uh, Proverbs uh, 30. And uh, let me go to it. Proverbs 30, verse 5. Every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. Strong words from Scripture on how we're to approach the Word of God. Right, yes. Right. Now, there, this is a real danger, and Christians have been, excused by skepti been accused by skeptics of, uh, of making the Bible say whatever they want it to. Right, and I've heard that before. Well, you Christians, you can make your Bible say this, you can make it say that. Right. And so, actually, they're right. If, if, if you look at some Christians, they are running around saying, well, you can take this as this, and this as that, and you can interpret the Bible any way you want to. And we're saying, no, there are principles involved in how we should understand Scripture. And that's what we want to do today. Right. We've got a little. We, we, we did. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Sarfati did refuting compromise. We're going to do the, the summary version of that. Fifteen reasons to take Genesis as history. Many Christians are convinced that scientists have proven that the universe is billions of years old. In Genesis one, we learn that God created the heavens, the earth, and all they contain in six days. It's plain to see that the word day in Genesis 1 clearly means a literal 24-hour day. The Hebrew word for day is used more than 2,300 times throughout the Old Testament, but its meaning is only questioned in Genesis. Why? Because the idea of millions of years is so ingrained in our society today. Each issue of Creation Magazine contains articles by scientists refuting the millions of years and supporting a recent creation in six real days, just like the Bible says. Creation Ministries International staff, many from a wide variety of scientific disciplines, have produced thousands of articles now available in a massive online database. Creation.com has grown to become the world's most powerful internet resource on the creation evolution issue. There are more than 6,500 articles already online and new articles are added daily. Some of the topics covered include the feasibility of Noah's Ark and evidence for a global flood the age of the earth from both the Bible and science, scientific arguments against the Big Bang and models that explain observations in astronomy within a young earth time frame, recent discoveries that support dinosaurs fitting with biblical history, evidence from biology that shows that the type of change that is observed in living things has absolutely nothing to do with evolution, and many more topics. These thousands of articles are available for free 24 hours a day to anyone on earth with an internet connection. Genesis is one of the most attacked areas of the Bible. Creation.com provides logical, scientifically accurate counterattacks in this area. As 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5 says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. 
Got questions? Get answers at creation.com. In an effort to imply that biblical writers were primitive, many people have said that the Bible teaches that the earth is flat. Even though the round shape of our planet was an obvious conclusion when watching ships disappear over the horizon and by observing eclipse shadows, what does the Bible say? The implication of a round earth is seen in the New Testament where Jesus described his return. In Luke 17, 31, Jesus said, in that day, then in verse 34, in that night, this is an allusion to light on one side of the globe and darkness on the other simultaneously. In the Old Testament, we read in Isaiah 40, 22, it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. Inspired by their creator, the earth shape was well known to biblical writers. Okay, 15 reasons why you should take Genesis as real history. We're going to do this rapid fire as quick as we can and, and just get right into this. So number one, uh, a Christian should follow Christ's example of how he, Jesus, viewed the Old Testament. So how did... How did uh, Jesus view uh, That's Old a good Testament place scripture? To start, right. What would Jesus read? <laughs> what would Jesus, <laughs> how would he understand? How, would he it? He read? how he wrote it. Yes. Um, Jesus regarded all of the Old Testament scriptures as God's word. Yeah, that, that's plainly what you read, right? With equal authority. And he often said, said things like, it is written, have you not read? And he was referring to, of course, the Old the Testament. Old Testament. Which contains Genesis. Right. Yes. So uh, it's authoritative in everything, right? That's what the Bible is. It's so it shouldn't contain errors or, or anything like that. Proper reading of scriptures is exegesis, right? You, you read out of scripture. You let the word of God speak to you. You don't take your preconceived ideas and, and read into it. That's right. eisegesis. That's eisegesis, the right, other way. Right. Yep. So, you know, when, when people are saying, well, you know, you Christians, you, you, you look at different things differently, and I know there's denominational issues and stuff like that, but really what we're talking about here, especially with creation ministries, is, well, my geology professor says this, so therefore we need to modify the text. Well, you're taking right. information from outside and applying it to what? the word says. So that, right. that, that's the wrong way to look at scripture. Number two, here's the second reason to take Genesis as real history. Jesus clearly regarded the stories of Adam and Eve and the flood as factual. So, well, let, let's, let's look at some examples of that, right? We've got the, the account of Adam and Eve and uh, many Bible teachers are saying, well, that's kind of mythology or, or just an analogy of the human race, this, this type of thing. Right. Well, let's see what Jesus said. Matthew 19. Verse 4, he says, haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made the male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and will be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh so that they are no longer two but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. So here Jesus is, is referring, it's actually, he was questioning about divorce, right. which concerns marriage. You go back to the origin of marriage, what was the first marriage, Adam and Eve, right. not two ape men, uh, the ape, ape man, ape woman, that kind of thing. So he saw them as real historical people. And that's why we have marriage. That's marriage, it's Today, one man for one woman that's for life. Right. Yes. Well, what about the flood? You know, many, many skeptics I, I you know, come across would kind of deny uh, that the flood ever was a real account. Well, it was, uh, if it was, it was just a local flood over in Mesopotamia or, or something right. like this, right? Well, let's see what uh, Jesus has to say about this. Matthew 24, uh, 37, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. So he's talking about the coming judgment is likely going to be the former judgment. Okay, so and, if if the former judgment was just based on a myth or, or the flood was an allegory of some kind of the, uh, the resetting of mankind to a, a better state, then what is that saying about the, the judgment to come? Right. Continuing here, Matthew 24, 39, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So he's relating the two. Exactly. An actual event in the past will, will, will relate to an actual event in the future. Exactly. Um, so again, he, he believed in the flood, and, and you can say, well, maybe he believed in the local flood, but it really doesn't make sense according to what he, he said about, about Scripture. How about uh, things like, um, you know, Jonah and the great fish? 
what, what, what did he believe about that? You know, a lot of people say, well, can you really believe stories like that? Well, the actually, Old Testament, obviously. Yeah, Jesus did, Matthew 12, 40, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So he's making an analogy here. When he dies and is in the tomb for three days and then his resurrection, and he's relating that back to a real event in history, uh, you know, Jonah and the great fish. So right. he, he obviously, uh, you know, took this to be real history. Uh, number three, here's the third reason why you should take Genesis as real history is because Genesis was written as history. Many people try to say, well, it's poetic or, or stuff like that, but it really isn't. That's a good reason. That's a great reason. Look at Genesis, day one, day two, what God created on each day. You know, can we make parallels to other areas in Scripture? We certainly can. Look at the book of Numbers, 7, 10 here. And the chiefs offered offerings for the dedication of the altar on the day it was anointed, and the chiefs offered their offering before the altar. So they're making an offering. Look at the way it's written. Uh, and the Lord said to Moses, they shall offer their offerings one chief each day for the dedication of the altar. And when we come back, what I'm going to do is show how this next verse here, number seven, parallels the days of Genesis in a sequential order. It's written as real history. Right. Jesus, the Creator. Jesus Christ, who walked the earth 2,000 years ago, is also the Creator of the universe. Colossians 1.16 says, For by Him all things were created things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. Also in John 1, 3 we read, all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus Christ is the Creator God. Not only does scripture confirm it, but during his earthly ministry, Jesus did things only the Creator God could do. Okay, we were talking about uh, a verse in Numbers right. where the uh, children of Israel are offering um, an offering. And we're going to parallel this to the way Genesis 1 is written. You know, on this day God creates this, and this day God creates that. A sequential event, written as history. And look at uh, what it says here in Numbers 7.12. He who offered his offering the first day was Nashon, the son of Amminadab of the tribe of Judah. On the first day he offered his offering. It, it, it's very clear. No, no one's arguing what the word day means here in, in right. Numbers yes. or anything yes. like this. On the second day, Nathanael, the son of Zuar, the chief of Issachar, made an offering. This is what happened. It was on the second day. This is who did it. It's right. very clear. It's Pretty written as history. Understand. Yes. Just go, go look at Genesis and you'll, you'll see the same type of writing. On the twelfth day, of course, we've gone through all the days here and I'm just summarizing. On the twelfth day, Ahira, the son of Anan, the chief of the people of Naphtali. So, on the twelfth day. No one's arguing about what the days mean anywhere except right. for and the way Genesis. it's written is kind of the same in Genesis. You've got s certain events happen on a particular day, yep. and then God looks at it and wraps it up, and it's all yeah, fine. Yeah, it's got a number and, you know, and, yes. and all that stuff. So it, it, Genesis was written as history. Here's a way to look at it in this diagram. We've got 4,000 years recorded in the Bible. We've got from creation to Abraham is about 2,000 years. We've got from Abraham to when Jesus was here, and a little bit beyond there is 2,000 years. So there's 4,000 years of recorded history. If you're saying Genesis 1 to 11, there's, there's a myth or analogy or, or something like that, you're saying 50% of the recorded time in, in Scripture right. is an analogy or mythology. It, it, it doesn't make sense. Okay, so let's go to the next reason why we should take Genesis as history. Hermeneutical principle, Scripture interprets Scripture. The rest of the Old Testament takes Genesis as history. Right, when it's referred to and when, that kind of thing, when, when, it's, they were, when it's quoted from. Yes, and here's some quotes from the Old Testament, Exodus 20, 11. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. I mean, there's no room for any, you know, the, 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 the heaven and earth is a, is a Hebrew merism. It's all-encompassing. means the whole cosmos was created in six days by Everything God. Everything was made in six days. It's a basis for our work week. Exactly. Yeah. Um, let's continue here. Here's another hermeneutical principle. Scripture interprets Scripture, of course. The rest of the New Testament takes Genesis as history. It's not just 
the Old Testament interpreting right, itself. Right. What does the, the, the New Testament say? And, uh, well, we see over and over again that the New Testament is very clear that it, it's, re it's referring to... Um, to real events. To real events over and over and yes. over again. Um, over 100 uh, quotations or allusions to Genesis 1 to 11 in the New Testament. And none of them allude to Genesis as anything but real history. So um, all the genealogies in the Bible go all the way back to a real man, Adam. Right, right? not a metaphor or not, <laughs> not, a, not a, a mythical figure, but I mean, all those people were real people and certainly Adam was as well. That's right. Um, Hebrews 11 lists heroes of the faith would start with Abel, right? Uh, Cain and Abel, Enoch and Noah. There's no hint in there that these people are less historical than, right. than, than yes. anybody else. Than, than right? those later in history. Right. Uh, Second Peter 3 refers to creation uh, and the flood, uh, as, as is plainly written in Genesis, again, as real events that happened in history. There's just nowhere in, in the Bible where we get this concept of millions of years. Let's just be honest, folks. When, when, when we're seeing these, these types of ways of interpreting Scripture, uh, it really doesn't have anything to do with the Bible. Right. right? Where, where on earth in the Bible do you read about millions of years or, or you know, death before sin? Well, again, or those, are, those are outside ideas. Again, that hermeneutical principle, um, uh, Scripture, interpreting Scripture. Um, th th you look at Scripture, look at how it's written, and these other reasons that we're talking about on, on this particular episode. Right. Just take it as it's written, and it says, recent creation in six literal days. Six literal days, that's yeah. right. No need to add the millions of years. That's right. And we'll be back. When Dr. Carl Whelan started Creation Magazine in his home in 1978, little did he realize that today it would reach into some 170 countries all around the world and have such a huge impact in so many lives. This unique 56-page full-color family magazine refutes evolution and gives God the glory for the amazing creation we see around us. Creation Magazine is an essential tool for anyone wanting to immunize their family against the anti-biblical worldviews bombarding us from all sides. With no paid advertising, every page in Creation Magazine is chock full of powerful articles, ammunition to intelligently discuss nature, history, science, the Bible, and related subjects. Although written for laypeople, every effort is made to ensure the content is technically accurate so that even experts are satisfied, and young children look forward to the section written especially for them. Many have come to faith in Christ because of subscribers sharing this magazine with them. So subscribing not only boosts your faith, it enables you to get biblical truth into your community in a special way. Subscribe today and have it delivered to your home every three months. Visit creation.com for subscription information or call the CMI office nearest you. Okay, 15 reasons to take Genesis as real history, and we're coming up to number, number six. six. So taking Genesis as history is consistent with God's other creative miracles in history, right? right? When, when God created the world, he spoke the world into existence. Well, if we look at uh, the other miracles, um, you know, that Jesus did, how did he perform the miracles? He said, take that water, pour it into here, water turns into wine. He just it, it happened, right? Um, we've it's got the account. Commands, yeah. yeah, just by his word. Matthew 8, 5 to 13. Uh, this is a story of the faithful centurion. Remember the, the story where, right. where yes. the, uh, the centurion comes to, to Jesus and, and he says, well, I've got a servant and, he, and he's sick. Could you, you know, could you heal him? And, and Jesus says, well, okay, he's going to come. And he says, no, 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 no. I, I just tell my servants what to do and they just do it because I'm, I'm, I've got the authority and I know you're going to just be able to say that and, and he's going to be healed. Yes, and that was an amazing story. Yeah, yep. and Jesus says, wow, I haven't found faith like this you know, anywhere. But he recognized the authority <laughs> of the word, the power of his word, and of course Jesus as the creator just said it and it, and it was so. So yes. that, that's consistent with God just creating instantaneously. That's, that's how he did his, performed his like other miracles. Like the other miracles, yes. Right. So, let's uh, move on here quickly. Number seven, 
the history in Genesis is necessary to explain death and suffering. I mean, uh, we, we've beaten this one to death. <laughs> <laughs> I know. No, I, I know. Mean, but that, it's such an important point, right? It, it is. It, it, take away Genesis. Take away all those events back there. A, a, a very good world. Then Adam brings sin and death, sin into the world. Right. And and that is cursed with death. Death entering the world after sin. Take that away, or make that mythological, or just an allegory for right. for something else, and you destroy the gospel. You do, because now you've got death before sin, and nothing really seems to hang together. And again, you, you've mentioned we've sort of beat this to death, but let's go over it briefly, just because we're talking <laughs> about the, the scripture, Romans five twelve. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. That's where death comes from, and it's human death too. Some people try to squeak out of it. Well, it was just, uh, you know, um, or H maybe, maybe death. death and, and, well, we, we can look at other things like God calls his creation very good. Could the fossil right. record have existed at that point? And we, we've mentioned this on, on previous yeah. episodes as well. First Corinthians 15, for as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so as in Christ shall all be made alive. Well, there's, I mean, there's that connection. Just uh, you, You've got the first Adam who brings death, the last Adam who brings life. Which Adam is non-essential to the gospel? Neither. You need both of them. Right. They both need right. to be real people too, by the way. And, and, and you just made the point, actually, because point number eight, why you just take uh, Genesis as real history, is this, the history in Genesis is foundational to the gospel. This isn't a side issue. Sometimes, oh, well, you creationists, you know, it's, it's a side it's issue. A, or, yeah, it's, or, or yeah. <laughs> it's not as important as, as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and, and the New Testament and so right. on. Right, because the results in disbelieving in, in, in a, a little literal Genesis, I, I'm going to demonstrate these in some quotes uh, coming up here. This is by Bishop Hugh uh, Modifier, and this is in the Confirmation Notebook published by the Anglican publisher in the UK. So this is your confirmation notebook after you've gone through you know, your church right. upbringing right. And, and this type of thing. And uh, this is what he said. This is in the confirmation notebook. <laughs> yes, Human beings are the result <laughs> of evolution and shaped by natural selection. It's hard to believe that it's in the confirmation notebook. Yeah, so that's how you were created over millions of years, right? And then he said this, what the cross is not. The son standing in my place and taking the punishment that I ought to have, such a view is immoral. Now. For Bible-believing Christians that are watching this program, you know, you, you might not understand how, how could someone who claims to be a Christian go from what the Bible teaches to this position, but it makes sense. If we just evolved over millions of years, death has always been with us. As a matter of fact, horrific death has always been with us. Cancer, disease, pain, animals killing other animals, ape men, you know, clubbing right, one another right. for dominance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then how could the message of the cross be atonement right. for sins? I mean, you, you said it makes sense. It makes sense if you start your thinking with evolution, right? Right. What I'm that. saying is it's consistent yes. with, with if, if you believe in evolution. And that is, of course, where this particular bishop, Hugh Montefiore, begins his thinking. You say he that way that, better than I do, by it, the way. It's, well, it's not an easy last name to pronounce, <laughs> but I think that is how you, how you say it. But he begins with evolution. Right. And then what the cross is not, well, it's not the sun standing in my place. Right. You, you, you end up destroying the gospel. So we're going to come back and we're going to get on to point number nine. Why should take Here we go. It's real history. Some Christians believe that evolution should not be taught in public schools. Creation Ministries isn't against the teaching of evolution. However, it should be taught warts and all. That is not only the evidence for it, but the growing evidence against it. Currently, evidence against evolution is censored so that students hear only the case for it. Proverbs 18.17 says, The one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. When evolution is taught along with all of its scientific problems, many people reject it. Any scientific theory should be able to withstand close and honest scrutiny but evolutionists lobby hard to keep any evidence against evolution out of the classroom. All right, 15 reasons to take Genesis as history. We are at point number nine. Point number nine, the history in Genesis is necessary for a cohesive and coherent biblical Christian worldview. Right. Certainly true. So 
what is the consistent and coherent Christian worldview that's been taught by the, the church for many, many, many years now, uh, especially prior to evolution, uh, would be this. If, if for a Christian to have a consistent worldview, you basically, it's, it's not the key piece of the puzzle, right? Jesus is the foundational piece of the puzzle here, and I've got this, this diagram, but it starts off with a good creation. Everything's very good in the beginning. Right. Sin and death enter, uh, so there could be no death before that as Adam sins. That's, that's the curse. People have understood that, that for years. That history in Genesis yep. building up to eventually the cross. Right. Uh, the, the concept of judgment, that God is going to judge this world in the future. And, of course, he's done it there in the past. In the past. There's a, a record event. all over the earth with fossils and, and, and stuff like yes. that. That makes sense because it happens after Adam sins. And he's going to judge us based on the law. Well, what's the law? That's right and wrong. You know, this is what our social doctrines are based on in the Western world, that kind of thing. Um, and that's why we need Christ, right? The knowledge of sin leads us to the, the foot of the cross. And, and what's that message? Well, Jesus was born of a virgin, right? This is foretold in prophecy, right? It's a, it's a real event. He lives his life. He, he lives. He dies on the cross. He right. rose again and after after three days. Yes, and all that happened in a, in a real town, in a real place, in real history. Right. With real rocks and a real wooden cross and yes. real iron nails. And, and we, we couldn't redeem ourselves. That's why he needed to come. That it, like we're, we live in this sin-cursed world because of what the first Adam did. He became the last Adam. And then the Bible says that there's going to be a future uh, that's, you know, some people call it the restoration. It's not going to be exactly the way the first original world was, right? There's right. going to the be some differences. The new heavens and new earth. Yes. But right. that's, the, that's the consistent Christian worldview, beginning with those events back in Genesis, ending with the events yet to come. Exactly. So here's another uh, reason. Number 10, disbelieving the history of Genesis disconnects the Bible from the real world. You're saying, well, one part of the Bible is real, but another part of the Bible can just be mythology. or Right, yes. And Thomas Huxley, back in Darwin's time, it was right. called Darwin's Bulldog. <laughs> he, 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 he really promoted Darwinian evolution right. in, in a major way, even more than Darwin uh, uh, most of the time. And he could see right through that. Mm -hmm. If you Christians, if you disbelieve Genesis, yeah. well, everything else falls with it. Look at some of his writings, what he says here. I confess I soon lose my way when I try to follow those who walk delicately among types and allegories. Right. He says, a certain passion for clearness forces me to ask bluntly whether the writer, he's talking here, uh, um, the writer of the, the Bible, the writer of the Bible, whether the writer means to say that Jesus did not believe the stories in question or that he did. Right. Did he or didn't he? He continues, when Jesus spoke, as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, that the flood came and destroyed them all, did he believe that the deluge really took place or not? And he continues, or uh, that's the, it, it, it's just, it, he's, he's pointing out the inconsistencies when right. Christians try to do this. Right. Uh, he, he can see it back then, skeptics see it back now, or they, they, they see it now. Right now, yes. Um, there, there's many skeptics. Here, here's another example. Uh, Richard Bozarth, he's talking about the meaning of evolution in American Atheist magazine. And he said this, it becomes clear now that the whole justification of Jesus' life and death is predicated on the existence of Adam and the forbidden fruit he and Eve ate. Without the original sin, who needs to be redeemed? Without Adam's fall into a life of constant sin, terminated by death, what purpose is there to Christianity? That's a quote that we use quite a bit, uh, um, just to show how the atheists can see this, this nonsense of, of, of trying to believe in Jesus, but never mind about Genesis. Genesis is an allegory, Genesis is myth, it's not real history that the atheists can see that you right. can't do that. So in Darwin's time, you got people like Huxley. It's inconsistent Christians. Then this quote is from 1979. It's inconsistent Christians. Well, yes. what are the new atheists saying? What are people like Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and yes. the, the, the new atheists, what are they saying? The same thing, I'll bet. Same thing. <laughs> this was Richard Dawkins in, in the, the show, The Root of All Evil. And now, this is 2006. The Root of All Evil. What was the Root of All Evil according to Dawkins? Christianity, yes. the, a religion, right? Yeah. This is what he said. So he's talking about people that, you know, are talking about, well, you know, maybe Genesis is just an allegory, et cetera, et cetera. They're trying to blend evolution with Christianity. He says, right. oh, but of course the story of Adam and Eve was only ever symbolic, wasn't it? Symbolic? Jesus had himself tortured and executed for a symbolic sin by a non-existent individual. Right? I mean, he's, uh, he's pointing out how nonsensical it is to say that sin was symbolic. <laughs> he actually yeah. says, um, nobody not brought up in the faith could reach any verdict other than than parking mad. <laughs> Here's Dawkins. Please. 15 reasons to take Genesis as history. 
Many have been misled into thinking that the Genesis account of creation is not actual history, but is just some sort of theological argument. This small book succinctly shows why those who believe in the inspiration of scripture have no intellectually honest choice but to take Genesis as straightforward history, just as Jesus did. This booklet powerfully challenges one of the major problems in the church today that affects the authority of the entire Bible. Read it and give it to your pastor or particularly anyone contemplating theological training. It could save them from getting derailed by some of the misleading arguments common in theological academia. Written for the serious Bible believer, PhD authors Don Batten and Jonathan Sarfati bring clarity to an issue that has plagued the church for over 100 years. All right, and this is the In the News section mm -hmm. where we uh, we'll just take a little break from uh, the 15 reasons to take Genesis as history and just look at what's what's happened in the news recently, news reports that come out involving creation, evolution, and, and Christianity, that kind of thing. Right. So we've got an article here uh, that's from our website called mm -hmm. uh, that, that we entitled "When Will Europe Wake Up?" Right. So a bit of a bit of a, an interesting title as <laughs> as we get started. The Council of Europe condemns creationism, but it ought to con reconsider where the threat to human and civic rights really is coming from. Mm -hmm. And that's the that's kind of the subtitle here. This is by Dr. Jonathan Sarfati and Dr. David Kachapool from our Australian office, and it begins this way: In June last year. And this is, uh, what's the date on this? This is, uh, must be referring to 07, right? Yeah. I think so. Yeah, I believe uh, it was. In 07. June last year, so that would be June 07, when the Council of Europe uh, Parliamentary Assembly called off a scheduled vote on a resolution banning creationism from school science classes, many creationists rejoiced. So this vote was, was, was canceled. Right. <coughs> However, it turned out that the vote was only postponed, not canceled. The Parliament later, in October, passed the resolution by 48 votes to 25, declaring, this is a quote, if we are not careful, creationism could become a threat to human rights. And our, 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 the article continues here. It's quite a lengthy article. Mm. What, an incredible, what an incredibly naive statement, given that the only rights that humans can ever genuinely claim are those bestowed by the Creator. But for those who deny a creator any perceived rights can only be those resulting from a temporary consensus in the midst of ever shifting an ever shifting base of human opinion. I think that's a great point. You know, when, when we're talking about rights, who who gave us those rights? Yeah, uh, how, do, do, how do we get those rights? Did I society mean, uh, determine where your rights come from? Because if society does, then you gotta look at of course extreme examples like Hitler's Germany. Well, who who decides whose rights? Like who ultimately gets to decide whose rights are, are you know? I mean, and that's a, it's a very, very complex question if you're thinking from an evolutionary perspective right. that, that all humans evolved from prior creatures and there's no God, uh, there, there's no one who sets what's absolute right and absolute wrong, right. and, and, and those, those standards of right and wrong are fluid and, and we can reinterpret what's right and wrong and so on, yeah. Th then who, deter as, you, as you put it, who determines the rights that individuals have. I think many people have this idea of creationists that, you know, they're they're just, I don't know, Bible bashers or they're unintelligent or they're not really, you know, thinking. <laughs> I mean, I think if you're you're actually honest, the most people that I talk to that are honest, even if they don't take our position, when they look at our arguments, they go, you know what, you guys have good arguments. I'm not talking about the people that just, you know, slam creationists and right, stuff. Right. They, go, yes. they go, wow, you guys really have legitimate reasons for your faith. They're, they're logical anyway, right? right. They're if, logical. If, and we're not trying to jam it down somebody's throat. We're saying, hey, let's have the discussion open. And, and shouldn't a student in a school be able to ask some questions? I mean, you wouldn't think so in Canada, in, in, for example, British Columbia. Right. It's the first province in Canada where they've banned. If you're a teacher and you, you, you mentioned creation or intelligent design, you're fired. Yeah, you're, you're, you're out of there. It sounds like Europe is, is going the same route. Well, and look hey, at We were first in Canada. Is that something to be proud of or ashamed of? <laughs> I'm pretty ashamed of it, to be honest. Yeah. But, uh, you know, when we look back in, in this evolution creation debate, you know, the Scopes trial, you know, many people have seen in, right. in, in Inherit the Wind, in, and it's, in it's the basically US, a yeah. 
Christian, an anti-Christian propaganda film because they distort what actually happened there to a certain right. degree, right? We used to carry, I remember, uh, you're, we don't do that anymore, but we used to carry the actual hardbound transcript right. of the entire trial. Right. Now why would, if it's, if, if it's anything like Inherit the Wind, why would a creationist organization carry that? Well, exactly. it's we, nothing like Inherit the Wind. We want to expose the truth. And really look at it, what, what happened. They were saying, back then the evolutionists were saying, well, you're teaching creationism, let's at least have another model we can go by. Now it's totally slipped. And if you even try to mention creation or, or intelligent designs, a lot of times you're, you're just... You're in danger of, of ridicule and losing right. your job. Well, here's another article I, I thought was great. Um, this is from uh, the News, Founds, uh, News Hounds Forum, and it's talking about uh, they found a Jurassic beaver. This was in NewScientist.com, and in this news service picked, the, picked this Jurassic, up. Jurassic, okay, now the Jurassic, uh, just to explain, there, there's different layers of rock, and those are date. They're, they're mentioned, uh, uh, they're given different names. The Jurassic right. rock is supposed to be dinosaur age rock. Right, right. So right. we got a Jurassic, what was it, a beaver? Beaver. Ju so this is supposedly a 164 Jurassic. million year old beaver. And, and this set me off on a search. I was like, well, that's pretty cool. You know, <laughs> when I was you know, studying um, evolution in school, I was taught that you know, there was a certain number of creatures that lived at certain time periods. And then they died out, and then you got another time period, and then so another they evolved into new ones. Right, and, and, yes. and these yeah. didn't overlap, right? You didn't have beavers living at the time of dinosaurs. Now, I'm being honest. Evolutionists have changed what they were taught, but I find that this information I'm going to share with people now really shocks them when they when they say what evolutionists are admitting. So, for example, here was one uh, from the BBC. The title of the article was "Cretaceous Duck Ruffles Feathers." Well, I bet it did ruffle some feathers, because they found a a, a duck like creature, and that's what they always say, and it was in the same level as a 70 million year old dinosaur. Okay. So, you know, when you were taught that, that evolutionary paradigm, you know, think about it, did you picture a T-Rex, you know, rawr, and then quack, 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 quack. quack. <laughs> <laughs> you know, most people go, wow. So I, I kept looking and, and then I found another one. Now this is a different duck-like creature. Dinosaur era birds surprisingly duck-like fossil suggests. But this one, however, was supposedly 110 million years old because they found it where they found it in the strata. Okay, yes. So here's a duck that's been a duck for another, you know, 40 they're, million they're, years. They're, they're, they're resistant to calling it a duck, aren't they? Right. They, duck -like it's it's duck-like, right? even though it's got the same features, uh, strikingly similar to today's birds, considering they lived alongside dinosaurs, th this type of thing. They're, they always try to put the caveats in. Look what it says. Because the bones were buried gently and slowly in mud, many of them remain uncrushed. <laughs> <laughs> See, you can't create a fossil slowly and gently. You got to bury the thing rapidly, right? But right. but the point is, soft tissues were also preserved, including flight feathers and the webbing, like a duck's between the bird's toes. 110 million years old, and you've got webbing preserved in the fossil. That amazing, right? And then this is the most amazing admission in the in the article. It said it may have looked like a duck and acted like a duck, but Gansus, what they called it, was no duck. So. <laughs> Well, I, I'm sorry, but farmer logic says if it looks like a duck, quacks right. like a duck, it's a duck. <laughs> okay, of course. Yeah, but it can't be a why? Why can't it be a duck to, to the folks at uh, at National Geographic News? Well, because you know it, it existed with the dinosaurs, and, and of course there it, must have been some evolutionary change. Now it looks just like a duck. But it can't be because our beloved evolution theory says ducks haven't evolved yet. Right. So, uh, so picture it now, folks. You got ducks. What else do you got? I found this one. This is a Nature magazine. It was a Mesozoic squirrel, a 70 million year old squirrel, flying squirrel. Well, flying squirrels okay. exist today, right? We got ducks. What else? Here's the Jurassic beaver. So here's your 164 million year old beaver. Here was a dinosaur killer. They found this, this, you know, um, a mammal, and it had eaten the Psittacosaurus. Wow, that's pretty neat. It's, it, it's eating a dinosaur, okay. and, uh, <laughs> and, and and they called it a Repinomammus robustus. Well, that looks exactly like a modern-day honey badger. So think about it, folks. There, you you can badgers look, eating dinosaurs. Yeah, you can look at the graphic there, and you got T. Rex. He's pretty puzzled. You got beavers, ducks, all sorts of things coexisting at the same time. Kind of just shocker for what we were taught in school. That's right. People believe that aliens from distant planets may hold the key to understanding the mysteries of life. However, belief in life in outer space is rooted in belief in the theory of evolution. A popular pro-ET website says, over the last half century, 
scientists have developed a theory of cosmic evolution that predicts that life is a natural phenomenon likely to develop on planets with suitable environmental conditions. In other words, if it happened here, it must have happened elsewhere. But repeatable science shows evolution didn't happen here. There is a message from a higher intelligence that tells us the real solution to life's mysteries. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The Age of the Earth Many people think that the Earth is billions of years old. But in this DVD presentation, geologist Dr. Taz Walker shows that the evidence actually fits best with the biblical record of history. Don't modern dating methods prove an ancient earth? Don't the facts from geology prove it? Dr. Walker challenges us. How can we truly know the age of the earth? He shows why there's only one reliable way to know the age of anything. Find out how in this illustrated presentation. Okay, so 15 reasons to take Genesis is real history, and we're up to number 11. And number 11 says, the church fathers accepted the young earth historical time frame and global flood of Genesis. Now this isn't, uh, I guess, proof of anything, but it, it, it's, it's certainly what we need to look at this. What did the church fathers understand from the scripture? Because if, if ideas about how to interpret the scripture changed at roughly the same time as long ages and Darwinian evolution was promoted, then it, it starts to get a little fishy, right? Right, right, right. right. Oh, well, why did everybody's opinion change? Is that what the scripture says, plainly, or is it... Yes, if Christians right. come up with a, with a fancy new interpretation of scripture today that the church fathers and, and people living for the last 2,000 years have somehow missed, that's a good indication that your interpretation is, is flawed. Based on enough. outside evidence that, yeah, exactly. So, so let's look at this. I've, I've just made some notes. Um, for example, Basil the Great, AD 327 to 379, he actually did a series of sermons on Genesis uh, called the Hexameron, and he argued for six literal days, and, and instantaneous creation by God of, of animals, plants, and, and the people, Okay. and uh, that all animals originally ate plants, as in Genesis 1, 29, and 30. Now, we've brought this up before. You know, if, if all animals are eating plants in the beginning, and all people too, that's what Genesis 1, 29, and 30 says, well, the fossil record contains animals eating each other. Right? right, you've got foss, one animal's Part tearing apart activity. another yeah. and stuff like that. And so, it just doesn't make sense. If the fossil record was laid down before Adam sinned, if the millions of years are right, God's creation, it's very good. You can picture Adam and Eve taking a stroll and, you know, I don't know, some gazelle coming by and the lion grabbing it and ripping it to pieces. No, this is very good. <laughs> it's not consistent. Right. Right, so again. Um, he even argued against ideas of transformation in this series. See, most people think Darwinian evolution is, well, it's new. It's not new. The concept of one creature turning into another over whatever mechanisms uh, has been around for a long time. Uh, the the anti-theistic uh, philosophers like Anaximander, uh, Epinomides, and uh, Lucretius taught these ideas before Jesus' time. So Darwin just sort of popularized a specific type of evolution and gave it names like right. natural selection. He brought and, natural selection into it. Yeah. Right. Um, now, some people have misconstrued the, the church father's position um, because although they believed in six literal days and God resting on the seventh, they then thought that it was kind of a metaphor for how, what the length of time the planet Earth would exist, 7,000 years. Right, okay. Right? But that's, yeah. that's a different topic, actually. Uh, they still believed in the six-day creation. Uh, yeah, they just the then, Bible was real history. And right. Certainly. Yeah. Right. And uh, then some, um, some cite Augustine and Origen, and they were of the Alexandrian school, so they looked at things a little more m metaphorically, I guess you could say. Because these guys, instead of believing in millions of years, they believe that God created everything in one day. Like, just boom, basically instantaneously. They were actually arguing the other way. And so some long agers have quoted them saying, see, they didn't take it as literal. But yeah, but they were going in the wrong direction. They were arguing the other direction. <laughs> yes, because God created in six days and rested on the seventh as a sample of our work week. It, it was for us that he created that way. He could right. have created instantaneously, but, but anyway. So let's move on to um, 
number 12 Number here. 12. The Reformers understood it as history. The great Reformers and, and Martin Luther and so on. We've got, uh, let's see what he says. Here's um, Actually, this is, uh, John this Calvin. is Calvin. Yeah. Um, and uh, he says, God himself took the space of six days for the purpose of accommodating his works to the capacity of men. That's just what we were mentioning. God created in six days, rested on the seventh as an example of a work week. Pattern for the work week, yes. Right. Yep. And then uh, again, we mentioned Luther as well. Uh, or, or Calvin we continues here. <laughs> A little more than 5,000 years have passed since the creation of the universe. Okay, so he's, he, he's talking about the, the, the creation week, God accommodating that to, for our purposes here, the creation week, and right. then he obviously believes in a young earth. Right. A little more than 5,000 years have passed. Right. John Calvin, him. Now we have, Martin, uh, now we have Luther, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, here we go. Okay. He, referring to Moses, calls a spade a spade. He employs the terms day and evening without allegory just as we customarily do. Right. We, assert, we assert that Moses spoke in the literal sense, not allegorically or figuratively. Right. And, he, and he continues, that the world with all its creatures was created within six days as the, word, <laughs> as the words read. If we do not comprehend the reason for this, let us remain pupils and leave the job of teacher to the Holy Spirit. I like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. So what's he saying here? Why don't we just let the Bible teach us, not try to tell God what we think He said That's because right. of the fallible opinion of man. In Genesis chapter 2, the order of creation seems to be different to that in chapter 1, with the plants being created after Adam. Does the Bible contradict itself here? A close look at the original language reveals that the plants mentioned in chapter 2 verse 5 refers to cultivated plants only, not all plants. The point being made is that in the world before the curse, before the appearance of thorns and thistles, no one was needed to cultivate plants. Another thing to keep in mind is that Genesis 2 is not a chronological account like chapter 1. It focuses mostly on the details of day 6. When the Bible appears to contradict itself, careful study always reveals that the Bible is free of contradiction. It really is the Word of God. Fifteen reasons and we're at number thirteen. <laughs> Here it is. Naturalism is essential for atheists. This should cause mature Christians to realize the foolishness of trying to deny the history in Genesis to accommodate it. This is a critical point here, okay? If you're an atheist, atheism, no God, that's your presupposition, there's right. no God. Evolution's the only game in town. There's no other way to explain the, you know, the, the big question in life, where do we come from? You right. must believe in evolution as an atheist. So if many of these atheists and humanist groups are promoting this theory over and over and over again, shouldn't Christians kind of be like, hmm, wait a sec. They, 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 it should they, cause a little concern, you'd think. Exactly. Right. Um, <laughs> how many people would believe in the theory of evolution if millions of years hadn't occurred? If the Earth was only 6,000 years old, how many would believe in evolution? Well, no one. No one. Evolution needs huge amounts of time. I, exactly. So there's, you know, because many times people will say, Christians say, well, we don't believe in evolution, but of course we believe in millions of years. Where did that idea come from? It didn't come from scripture, right? Um, right. And, and, and this whole concept that God, you know, used evolution to create, you know, so God um, directed evolution. Well, God directed evolution is an oxymoron. God directed a random chance process, an unguided process? It doesn't make sense. Right? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. I guess no. that's the biggest problem with it. It just doesn't right. make sense. And atheists admit, you know, look at Richard Dawkins in, in The Blind Watchmaker. He said, Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. See, before that, there was atheists, but you couldn't really explain why you didn't believe in God. Right. It was more of a blind faith, and, and well, still a blind faith yeah. today. But I mean, Dawkins is, is celebrating Darwin because, as, as you just quoted in his book there, he's, now it's possible to be intellectually fulfilled because right. we have a reason for how we got here. And uh, William Provine, uh, he actually said this. He said, belief in modern evolution makes atheists of people. He's an evolutionist and an atheist. And he's admitting this. He's, he's taught students. He says, one can have a religious view that is compatible with evolution only if the religious view is indistinguishable from atheism. And this is what we see with many modern Christians. Mm. They're saying, well, you know, everything's explained naturally now in the Bible. And well, what about the miracles? You know, that, that, that's, a, that's a huge problem. Right. So, so point 14. Abandoning the history of Genesis leads to heresy and apostasy. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, apostasy and just, just plain abandoning the faith. Right. I mean, many atheists today, they credit the theory of evolution once they got to university and they understand, right. and they began to, began to understand evolution. That was their reason for rejecting Christianity. Many Bible professing uh, Christians believing the Bible lose their faith once they understand. <laughs> yes, and, and, and Doc and some atheists have said that why would God, if, if God used evolution, why would God use a mechanism that later on people are going to use to disprove God's existence? Right. It, it's, it's the one way you could disprove God is to have a scientific mechanism that would replace him. So why would he a use a naturalistic that? way to, to, right. to get around the supernatural. Um, th th there was, there was uh, uh, an atheist who wrote a book, his name was F. Sherwood Taylor, yep. and he said this, he's, he's in England, I myself have little doubt that in England it was geology and the theory of evolution that changed us from a Christian to a pagan nation. Right. So he, that's a, that's a, it's a huge point to make. He's asked on a, on a BBC broadcasting show, he's an atheist, what, what Interview, caused this? Yes. Yeah. You know, think about this. Think of the once great theological seminaries. Think of Princeton and Harvard and all these, you know, you, you can actually <laughs> trace the, the fall of Princeton University like, like this, and I've, I've wrote some, some notes on this. Charles Hodge, he's the principal of Princeton Seminary from 97 to 78. He admitted long ages contradicted a plain uh, reading of the Bible, but he bowed his knee to science, even though he opposed Darwinism. The next generation, his son, A. A. Hodge, accepted millions of years and he started toying with the idea of theistic evolution. The next generation is B. B. Warfield. He took the next logical step and he became a Darwinian. He announced himself a Darwinian. These are Christians, right? Well, the next generation accepted Darwinian evolution outright, started questioning the Bible, like, you know, and questioning it, its, its reality, and Princeton is no more. Yes. It, it's, it's gone. It's no longer a Bible-believing seminary. And you can trace it through this concept of abandoning Genesis. So, and, and sure enough, that began in the late 1700s, early 1800s. Right. Back there. Exactly. The, when evolution began to become popular. So really, there's only one reason not to take Genesis as history, and that's the fallible theories of man in the form of historical science. That's, that's the only reason why people do that and of course that's what we're talking about all the time on this show we just wanted to cover these things in, in, a, in a different way today not so go, much going to the scientific stuff but just yes. proof and they're all summarized in that booklet as well that you can give to your pastor that's right Creation.com is the world's most powerful internet resource for finding answers to questions about the origins debate. Creation or evolution? When the results are in, which one is supported by scientific observations? Find out at Creation.com. Creation scientists and researchers from around the world have contributed more than 6,500 articles, many of which appeared in leading creationist publications like Creation Magazine and the Journal of Creation, over more than 30 years. When news breaks about the latest evolutionary ape man or some major supposed evidence for evolution, check out creation.com for a Christian creationist response. Each weekend the website features a feedback article, response to a web visitor's email feedback. Often the anti-creation arguments in skeptics' emails are refuted in a detailed response by a CMI staff member. So in a very practical way, believers can see that the Bible, and particularly Genesis, can be defended against the skeptics' arguments. The website includes an online store where you can browse through hundreds of the world's leading creationist books, DVDs, and related materials. Got questions? Get answers at creation.com. As we wrap things up here, we just want to take a, take a look at some of the feedback that comes in from mm -hmm. uh, uh, from people who respond via the website or send us questions via e via via letter snail mail mail or email. Um, now we often in this in this part of the show we do uh, kind of negative feedbacks from skeptics and so on and see how our scientific right. staff responds. So to we those. can teach people almost how to respond to these as things as a teaching tool. Yes, a kind of a debating tool or something like that. Here's here's a positive feedback that mm. came back, uh, and we titled it this way: Former Long Ager finds freedom in a literal Genesis. And he writes this, I, I was very interested to read the article Theistic Evolutionist 
and Safardi's response. This is Dr. Jonathan Safardi, uh, um, uh, one of our uh, Australian office, uh, one of the scientists in our Australian office. I'm consistently amazed at the tendency of Christians to put science over mm. scripture. But I know I shouldn't be. I too was once in the same position, mm. teaching the long ages theory in Bible studies. Quite simply, it was CMI's answers to the doubts that science put in my mind about scripture that brought me to the place where I'm now a firm believer in the literal nature of Genesis 1 to 11. And we could, I suppose we could pause and just say, well, by, by literal we mean take it as it's written, take it straightforwardly. Right. It doesn't mean that we believe the trees of the fields can clap their hands. <laughs> that's, it, 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 take it as it's written. Right. And I'm sure that that's the way this person means it as well. Exactly. Such a perspective actually enhances my understanding of science and provides much more opportunity to marvel at God's wisdom in creation and all that we see around us. While for the scientists it is their pride that blinds them to the truth, I believe for Christians it is the lack of submission to scripture really to all Jesus said and did including his crystal clear understanding of Genesis 1 to 11 as literal history. Right. Knowing that scripture can withstand the attack of this popular scientific, he's got in quotes here, dogma has set me free to accept all of it so much more. I may still struggle with parts of the Bible, he continues, but at least I'm sure the problem is with me, not it. <laughs> I mean, that, what, what, a great, what a great letter to write into us yeah. you know, and, and just to share that his, his journey as a Christian in coming to understand the authoritative nature, as, uh, right. the, the authoritative nature of the, of the biblical text. And I think it's good what you pointed out. I mean, we get cards, we get notes. I mean, I got one the other day. I, I, I come into work and, you know, we got the little mail slot there and, and there's a card from somebody where I've spoken at a church and people are saying, wow, this is great. We, that was, I really appreciated you guys coming in and giving us a reason for our faith. And changed my thinking, changed my, you know. Because yeah. oftentimes when you see those negative feedbacks, you think, well, does everybody, you know, <laughs> <laughs> negative? No, most churches are highly impacted when Creation Ministries comes in. Yes, and we've got a... Growing files, large a files of testimonies, of testimonies of changed lives. That's right, including many pastors. That's right. Because we, we got to agree that this can be a controversial issue. Sometimes pastors are a little leery about having creation ministry speakers in. They come in and then, wow, that was great, guys. After and the meeting, the, 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 the wariness of having us come in evaporates. Right, why? And we've found that hundreds of times. Because we weren't bashing. We don't walk in there and say, Oh, you know, if you're, an you're not a Christian, if you believe if you believe in millions of years, or, said that's such and a, we train all of our speakers to to, to do that. Right. Let, let's be respectful. That's what First Peter three fifteen says. Right. With gentleness and respect, we have to respect the fact that not everybody's right. going to think like us. Uphold the authority of Scripture. They they understand that we're there to to, to defend the Bible, not to make it say something that it doesn't say. Yes. Right. And and, uh, and and people are equipped and people are excited that they yeah. can read the, read I mean, the we'll, Bible. We'll gently point out the inconsistencies in some of the long age views. Gently. Right. But we're not there to say, you know, that, that's a common misconception right, for, for young earth creationists. Oh, if you don't believe what we believe, you're not saved. Folks, yeah. that, that's Misconception a, is the word uh, to use. There. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, I do have a, a letter here um, from a from a skeptical person, <laughs> and uh, I'd like to go through it because it relates to uh, some of the questions we dealt with here today, and, and maybe didn't get time to. And I'm sure we won't be able to get through the whole letter because it's it's quite long. But there are some points that I'd like to point out. Um, this person describes himself. He says, "Dear sirs, I'm what would be described as a theistic evolutionist. I'm a conservative Christian who believes that the Earth is about 4.6 billion years old and that life developed through the evolutionary process." So he's, that's great, right? He's announced his position. Um, the person responding says, I'm curious to, as to your reasoning for the self-description of a conservative Christian. When the very meaning of the word conservative is to hold the traditional values and beliefs. The conservative understanding of the Genesis creation of nearly all Christian forefathers maintaining even today as a fundamental in the conservative Christian community is the plain reading that God created in six little days approximately 6,000 years ago. This is important for people, you know, if you're watching the show and you're not sure and, and all that kind of stuff, think about what the statement's saying. A conservative Christian believes that scripture is authoritative right. and we should read it that way, right? Um, and, and anyway, he, he goes on and he's ex explaining why he believes uh, you know, Christians should be able to believe in the theory of evolution. Of course they can, but we believe it's inconsistent. And he came across an article where uh, we put out kind of 10 questions to ask yourself as a theistic evolutionist, right. why would yes. you know God do this? And so one here is a concept violated the goodness of God. The Bible says God is good. God describes his, his, his creation as very good. Then how sure. do you understand the goodness of God if God used evolution? 
And he says, well, the same way that I believe God is good when he commanded the Israelites to invade Canaan, to wipe out the early inhabitants of the promised land, etc., etc. Well, that's after the fall. That's after sin and death has already entered into the world. The original creation is what we're talking about. Did God right. really create a world with death and disease? And clearly that's not what the Bible says. So. Anyway, we'll see you next time.